or can you zoom two different pieces? And uh, the major piece is uh, the song cycle called Acts of Kindness, which is seven high acts. I would like to say a prayer. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you because of Jesus, we have access to the Father. Pray the Lord you bless each person here tonight in their lives. This is very important. And every person is of value in their sight. And what each person does, <coughs> we ask you to bless this council, bless the music, and touch people's hearts. And the power of your Holy Spirit. And then we also pray for this college. this evening to listen and explore the music of William Bollinger. I first discovered Bollinger's music as I was looking for a dissertation topic. I knew that I wanted to study a living composer, and specifically one who had written art song music for solo, lyric soprano voice, and piano. This idea led me to the Christian Fellowship of Art Music Composers website, where I came across Bollinger's name. William Bollinger, born in 1945, grew up in small town Paramus, New Jersey, as an only child. His father worked for General Motors while his mother pursued a music career. Bollinger's parents both expressed their appreciation for the arts in their own way. His father's intrigue with the simplicity of colonial style art led to his interest in antiques and inspired the family to open an antique store. His mother's passion for the arts was revealed through her talents as a skilled pianist. Her classical piano studies helped secure positions as a church organist and as a cocktail pianist. His mother's music career regularly exposed Bollinger to music as a young child, specifically jazz and swing music, though he preferred classical music. Bollinger's formal music training began with piano lessons at the age of nine, when his grandmother gifted the family with a piano. He attributes his grandmother and her thoughtful contribution to his early music education as a significant influence on him as a musician. He first recognized his potential as a composer after realizing how much he preferred improvising to actually practicing for his piano lessons. During eighth grade, with his mother's help, Bollinger wrote his first composition called For God and Freedom. The completion of his first composition inspired him to continue exploring this avenue of creative expression. Throughout high school, as more compositions ensued, he decided to pursue a degree in composition in college. Bollinger attended Manhattan School of Music for his bachelor's and master's degrees, where he earned a bachelor of music in uh, composition, master of music in music education, and master of music in composition. There, he studied composition under the tutelage of Nicholas Flagello, Ludmila Ulela, David Diamond, and Mario Davidas Davidowski. During this time, Bollinger started reading and writing a considerable amount of poetry to expand his knowledge and explore new ideas. He experimented with writing his own text and eventually discovered his passion for inspiring audiences through true stories about real people. After graduating with his master's degree, Bollinger began his music education career in the Westchester Public Schools, teaching elementary and middle school choir for 38 years. He claims being around children influenced his creativity and helped him better understand people, 
which is significant since his music is about people. He currently teaches composition and world music course as an adjunct faculty member here at Nia College. The overall style of Bollinger's art songs can be described as eclectic. They often conform stylistically to the character of the subject in the text. Bollinger possesses an inherent ability for storytelling and uses composition as an avenue to tell people's real-life stories. His preoccupation with words affects his compositional process. If he wants to write a beautiful melody, he will sometimes compose the music first before adding words. Otherwise, the text takes precedence and results in recitative-like writing. Another approach to text setting involves intermittent incorporation of spoken text among some lyrics. These shifts to spoken words frequently indicate a change in character voices. Specific to melody, Bollinger occasionally composes lyrical melodic phrases for the voice, but more frequently they are shorter melodic fragments, driven by his interpretation of how the characters relay their thoughts. His harmonic vocabulary predominantly lies in the Baroque and classical periods, with compositional techniques similar to his favorite composers, Haydn, Handel, and Bach. However, Bollinger will not confine his harmonic language to these periods if the text inspires him to explore another harmonic approach. The first set of songs presented today resulted from a collaboration project between Bollinger and Linda Ferreira. They met and became friends during summers spent at the Adirondack Festival of American Music. Ferreira attended as a soprano with the Greg Smith Singers, and Bollinger brought his new music to the festival for performance. As an active performer, Ferreira thoroughly enjoyed working with contemporary composers and having the opportunity to perform new music. She describes her working relationship with Bollinger. Quote, working with Bill was always wonderful. I always wanted to do my best, and then some, because he was so appreciative and grateful to be hearing we gave ourselves time to come up with a product that we all liked. Bill's music just makes sense to me. I love the interplay of the voice with piano and clarinet, and I love the solo voice things. They are genius. There is drama and sweetness and conversation and surprise." End quote. During conversations together, Ferrer shared with Bollinger about three people who left lasting impressions on her at an early age, Aunt Alice, Ruth, and Daddy Byrne. After hearing these stories, Bollinger encouraged Ferreira to write them as song texts that he would then set to music. He claims, since she knew his music so well, his text, her texts perfectly captured his style of storytelling. Three songs premiered at the Adirondack Festival and later were recorded on sound portraits by Tofox, a faculty trio at Tennessee Tech University comprised of soprano, piano, and clarinet, where Pereira performed as the soprano. During Bollinger's residency at Tennessee Tech, he directed and collaborated with the ensemble and their recordings of Alice, Ruth, and Daddy Byrne in addition to other compositions included on the CD. In Alice, Ferreira tells of her aunt Alice, her mother's eldest sibling, who scared her as a child. As a little girl, Ferreira perceived her aunt as a big, bossy, and mad elderly woman, at least until she started her parakeet and violet business. Her business eventually dissolved when she became so attached to her birds that she could not sell them anymore, and they all lived in her house. Bollinger portrays Ferreira's eccentric, eccentric aunt with non-traditional harmonies, unconventional tonality shifts, extreme contrasts using the full range of the piano, and disjunct melodic fragments. He highlights specific physical traits and characteristics of her personality with repeated melodic motives in the voice, as you can see from these excerpts, the repeated wide intervallic leaps accentuate her bossy, big, scary
scary and mad qualities. In the opening three measure, piano introduction, Bollinger quotes the tune to Alice Blue Young from the 1919 Broadway musical Irene. The chorus reads, In my sweet little Alice Blue Young, when I first wandered down into town, I was both proud and shy as I felt every eye. And in every shop window, I primped passing by. Then, in manner of fashion, I frowned, and the world seemed to smile all around. Till it wilted, I wore it. I'll always adore it. My sweet little Alice Blue Gown. I will now play the beginning of Alice Blue Gown, so you may hear the comparison with the opening measures of Alice. My sweet little Alice Blue Gown. Now Andrew will play the opening to Alice. Based on the first three measures of the song, one could expect Aunt Alice to be a sweet lady with a fun-loving personality to parallel Alice in her blue gown. Expectations are quickly shattered as the voice enters wildly with an outburst of Alice's name. Like young Alice's fascination with her blue gown, Aunt Alice seemed completely consumed with the one thing that she truly loved, her parakeets. For the sake of time, Ruth has been omitted from today's performance. The story recalls an instance where Ruth, a widow who lived with Herrera's family for a couple years, discovered Ferreira sneaking chocolate from the candy box, and Ruth used a parable about a cat and mouse to teach Ferreira a lesson. In the last song in the set, Ferreira fondly remembers her childhood neighbor, Daddy Vern. Quote, Until his death, I was very close to Daddy Vern. When I was an undergraduate, he came to one of my recitals that was entirely contemporary music. He pronounced it to be contemptible music, but still encouraged me and continued to pay for a large portion of my tuition for my degree. He was a wonderful, sweet man, a piano tuner, and a founder of the Art League of Danville, Illinois, where I grew up. He was always devoted to his wife, Hallie, who died young, and would tear up when, I talk, when he talked about her 20 years after she died." End quote. Like in Alice, Bollinger inserted, inserts direct musical quotations in Daddy Byrne. He quotes the well-known hymn, In the Garden, starting with the piano introduction and continuing throughout the song as intermittent fragments. Listen now to the words and tune of the first verse and chorus. Daddy Vern. For example, 
and the joy we share as we tarry there affirms the joy Daddy Fern experienced lingering on the memory of his beloved wife even until his final breath. Oh, <laughs> 
Thank <laughs> you. 
She seems to take a special interest in Benalisa, and one day comes bearing news about a family who wishes to adopt the little orphan girl. For the music of Benalisa, Bollinger sought to evoke a childlike character and parallel the scarcity Benalisa would have known from living in the streets. He achieves simplicity through a sparse piano accompaniment comp comprised of single notes or simple chords never spanning more than a major tenth. One could actually picture a child playing the accompaniment and singing along with the melody that contains a repeated melodic motive paired with every sung declamation of Benalisa's name. Bollinger employs spoken text set in rhythm as the singer shifts from narrator to the voice of Signora Selina. The spoken text underlines the revealing news of Benelisa's adoption and humanizes the character of Signora Selina by allowing the audience to hear inflection in her spoken words.
students, Bollinger crafted the idea of composing a cycle where he would set stories about people showing compassion for others. He compiled true stories from a variety of sources, then wrote his own text and formed the song cycle titled Acts of Kindness. Soprano, Dr. Tracy Rodas Satterfield, who premiered the work in 2006, wrote a blog entry about the cycle. Quote, Yesterday, I rec recorded a composer's recital featuring new art songs. There was one set of songs by William Bollinger or called Acts of Kindness that was particularly moving. There are seven songs in the cycle. The music is surprisingly tonal in parts and is constructed as a set of seven variations with each song set in a key a fourth higher than the previous one. It was interesting listening to this music and being surprised at how much the tonal aspects jutted out. Consequence of being accustomed to modern music now, I suppose. The text comes from, a, from various true stories of acts of kindness, some small, some great. Normally, I have a hard time paying attention to words in music, but this was perhaps the first time song lyrics have touched me so much. The last one made me cry." End quote. As mentioned by Dr. Satterfield, Bollinger constructed the cycle as seven variations over a seven-note chaconne. His implementation of chaconne reflects the influence of Bach, his favorite Baroque composer. The harmonic progression remains consistent throughout the cycle until the final song titled Second Sacrifice, when Bollinger adapts the chaconne to accommodate a pentatonic melody. For each song in Acts of Kindness, Bollinger's stylistic choices reflect the content of the text, including references to different cultures and characters' physical and or emotional state. The text of Bridge and Roses came from a story told by Reverend Peter Olson, a member of Bollinger's church and a former pastor. Reverend Olson is the unnamed man introduced at the onset of the story who appears weary and downcast until he notices a beautiful rose garden by a bridge. His emotional state changes when he learns about someone who committed suicide by jumping off that bridge and the garden owner's purpose for planting the roses. The owner hopes the garden's splendor will dissuade anyone else from jumping off the bridge by opening his her eyes to the beauty of life. The song's sparse accompaniment represents the emptiness experienced by the man or woman who committed suicide on that bridge, while soaring vocal phrases indicate the glimmer of hope for others who pass by the garden. Bollinger found the story that inspired two necklaces on the internet. In the song, he captures the youthfulness of the characters through fragmented text delivery resembling how a child would deliver the story with excitement and wonder behind every spoken word. For a little girl, witnessing her favorite necklace broken by the hands of a reckless boy would be quite a tragedy. The accompaniment highlights the drama of the situation as the piano suddenly transitions from its upper range, meant to evoke the glittering necklaces, to a menacing minor second turning figure, lower in its range as the boy draws near. The forward momentum swiftly halts as the girl mourns her broken necklace. Kayla, the girl with the cheap plastic necklace, selflessly offers the other girl her own necklace and exudes a sense of pride shown through text repetition on the phrase to wear upon seeing her new friend don her less extravagant necklace. The inspiration for First Journey originated from a story told by Bollinger's friend, Raymond Beagle. Set during the Third Reich in Nazi Germany, the text tells of a German woman who discreetly agrees to give a Jewish man some fresh tomatoes. If caught, she would endure costly consequences for her generosity and kindness. Bollinger depicts the two factions using distinct musical elements. The stormy and rhythmically driving accompaniment represents the brutality of Hitler's German followers, while the melodic augmented second interval on the text Jewish 
alludes to Middle Eastern and Judaic music. Bollinger musically indicates the Jewish man's physical state of exhaustion using pitched repetition and purposeful rest as the man conjures up enough energy to continue his journey. Second Journey, another story relayed to Bollinger by Raymond Beagle, tells of the kindness bestowed upon Osip Mandelstam's wife. Osip, a renowned Russian poet during Stalin's regime, was arrested for his satirical poem about Stalin and sentenced to forced labor in a transit camp where he died at age 47. After her husband's death, Nadezhda avoided arrest by routinely changing her place of residence. Similar to First Journey, Bollinger strategically notates, notes rest in the melody and accompaniment to signify Nadezhda's physical fatigue from her travels. The moments of silence actively play a role in the story's drama. Her emotional state progresses from fear, represented by short melodic phrase utterances, approximately two measures in length, to hope as phrase lengths double in size after meeting the cobbler and trusting his promise to always provide her with shoes. Drive the story for Freedom Begun from Frederick Douglass's autobiography titled The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass. The text recounts the mistreatment Frederick endured as a young slave boy until his new owner's wife, Sophia, treated him as her equal. She invested in Frederick's education by teaching him how to read, and as a result, greatly influenced his future as a leader in the abolition movement. Musically, Bollinger supports Frederick's hope for his future and the eradication of slavery by citing a text in the style of ragtime a genre symbolizing African-American freedom. Ragtime found its origins in African-American communities approximately 30 years after the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution passed in 1865. The style evokes a sense of freedom through its defining characteristics of syncopated, rhythmic syncopation. However, not all elements of the song subscribe to similar views on equality. Bollinger implements the phrase all men are created equal, as a refrain that generally functions to paradox the reality of African Americans during the 1800s. First Sacrifice is based on a true story Bollinger read on the internet. The text tells of a young Palestinian woman so consumed by anger towards the Israelis for the death of her brother that she volunteers to be a suicide bomber. She mindlessly follows the training of her superiors, but when the day comes to carry out the mission, she observes Israeli families together and realizes she would be taking human lives. Instead, she sacrifices her freedom by turning herself over to the authorities. The repeated melodic phrases and mechanical pitch repetition in the accompaniment denote the woman's initial emotional state one driven by anger and a desire to seek retribution. Upon humanizing the Israeli people, her emotional state changes to compassion. Bollinger musically reflects her mental shift by raising the vocal tessitura and range in the piano to set apart the moment she witnesses beauty in the people she intended to hate. In the early stages of this song cycle's conception, Bollinger approached his student teacher and asked if she knew any stories relating to kind acts, specifically from her Korean heritage. The story she told about a Korean baby girl adopted by missionaries in North Korea inspired the text for Second Sacrifice. Bollinger musically references the child's Korean culture through his inclusion of style features specific to Aryong, a popular Korean folk song characterized by a pentatonic melody, melodic turning figures, and triple meters. The style of the cycle ends much like how it began, bookended by simplicity, yet with different connotations. The sparseness of the accompaniment in Bridge, Bridge and Roses yields a feeling of emptiness, while in Second Sacrifice, it evokes youthfulness and innocence. Thank you. 
like to open it up for question and answer, and I'd like Bill to come forward. So if you guys have any questions or answers, or questions, and I will, we will have the answers, uh, hopefully, um, about anything you've heard today or about Bill's compositional process or anything. What are the time for <laughs> Um, what is your favorite um, act of kindness if you have to choose one? I think the most touching story is the story of adoption. That's my favorite, the last one. And it's it's very simplistic, but so meaningful. So. Yeah, anyone else? As a singer, how difficult is it to Like the talking within the song? That's not too difficult, I don't think. It was something new-ish, I guess, that I haven't done a lot of in art song. Um, it happens, though, in opera, you know, with your spoken dialogue and then you go into singing, but um, it, no, it wasn't too difficult. So was it, like, was this the first time you've seen that in art song? Um, Probably of what I've sung, yes. But I know it happens, I'm sure, other times. <coughs> Anyone else? Yes. I noticed and appreciated that you uh, committed the music to memory. And that is an awesome job, and I want to applaud you for that. And how, how difficult was that? It is challenging. Um, <laughs> I will say, though, as a performer, once you get past the level of memory, it's so much easier to perform when you don't have something in front of you that you're relying on. Um, I know often oratorios are done with music, but my teacher has always said, the more you can get out of the music, the better you're gonna perform. So um, I had spoken with Bill's classes some yesterday and said in, that I'm working my doctorate and in six semesters we get five recitals. So it's very quick and you just learn to learn music quickly. So I gave a recital in November and then um, last year and started looking and learning this music in January, although I chose this music prior to then, but started actually working on it in January. I gave a recital at University of Nebraska Lincoln in April. So I've lived with it now for even longer and it feels even more comfortable. She worked with it. Yes, it's lived and worked with it for even longer. So the more, you, it's, it is fun doing a recital a second time you have a level of comfort after the first run through. So. Sorry, one more question. So yeah. uh, your dissertation is, is it a, a, a combination of a few composers or Bill is your It's team? just a Bill and of these. I did 10 today, but it will include Ruth as well, the one you did not hear. So. Any other question? That's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> about all the things that Katie was saying about, you know, up and motives and, and all the comments that you made about the music, did you know all those things? Uh, <laughs> yes and no. There's some, okay. some things that, oh, I'm trying to do that. That's right. And, uh, yes, he did a very good job Excellent explaining job. it. And right. since I'm talking about her, just honestly. So that's, I think, the best performance I've heard of the song. The song, the song's like the end. And uh, it was very, very fun. And very blessed by it. I will say, just, sorry, um, I will say as a writer, uh, Bill gave me license to make interpretive decisions um, as I'm writing. So. Some things I have consulted and said, did you think about this when you were writing this? Some things, as we cannot talk to Bach anymore, and often writers now do make assumptions about possibly what he would have thought. So I'm approaching it kind of from two different angles, um, some getting his input, but also some coming up with things that I've discovered that maybe he didn't necessarily think about when he was composing, but could be a logical explanation for what the product is. Yesterday I had this very strong thought how um, I always call it the church balance sheet, God creates, I arrange. It's such a sense of 
what hearing all this music I wrote, how I didn't invent the chords or the words or anything. It's like I'm, I'm, I'm drawing from that. And also how a performer does the exact same thing, because they're drawing also from something that pre-exists. We, God is the source. Uh, and the devil tends to twist the source around and create some garbage. But generally speaking, especially in music, you, you hear this whole system of two things, pitch and rhythm, and from that, and a couple of the nuances, we get all the music in the world, all the different stuff that's astounding. followed what was written on the page just because time-wise <laughs> where I'm trying to fit this into a year of writing a dissertation and so um, it's not really like could you make these changes I mean we could have that conversation eventually could you make these changes here's here are my thoughts but no it's a lot of what was printed on the page I would say um, in Alice specifically working with my pianist at, in Nebraska um, there were questions as far as um, where the octaves are played and and such, and so that was, we had dialogue about some of those things. Yeah. Andrew, what was a, uh, a piece that you, uh, tell me something about playing the music that you did such a good job as well, it was very challenging. <laughs> um, but Yeah, and my pianist in Nebraska and I have been working on it since January, so my level of comfort was very, very comfortable. I know Andrew is a little bit newer to the project, but oh, yeah. we, he did a good job. So. The hardest piece to play in the piano was the first one you heard, and the symbolism is the last one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Choosing it? Yes, I, I do like the text. Um, yeah, you hear the birds throughout Alice and yeah. the violets we talked about in rehearsal, um, what the violet motive was. And so it, it gives you something to do in the interludes, I would say, um, something to think about as the story keeps going with the piano. So, yeah, or even as the voice is singing as well. Okay. Yeah. 
there's a quote that Claudio Monteverdi's brother, do you remember Claudio's brother's first name? Me neither, but, but he, this is a quote he said, uh, um, the words should be the mistress of the music, not the maid servant. In other words, the words have equal power to the music. So to me, the words and the music, for me, as people do different, composers, we do different things. I'm going to quote uh, Michelangelo, an artist cannot appreciate another artist's work because he would do it differently. But for me, the words of music are equally important. And uh, that's always been my way of working with them. Anyone else? Okay, well, thank you guys so much for coming and allowing me to be here and present this music. So. And we have refreshments in the back. <laughs>